He come, come to this hour of mercy, we come to this year of mercy on this Friday afternoon. We come into your presence, Lord, asking for mercy and healing for ourselves. And those that we're praying for and carry with us in our retreat, we ask for a word from you as we read again your inspired word. In the end of the eighth chapter of the Apocalypse, we have this puzzling vision that comes in the paragraph that starts at verse 6. It's been much discussed because of the word that comes into it here. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a huge star fell from the sky burning like a ball of fire, and it fell on a third of all rivers and on the springs of water. This was the star called Wormwood, and a third of all water turned into Wormwood, so that many people died. The water had become so bitter. It was in May of 1986 that we had the partial, at least, meltdown into the core of the earth with the nuclear disaster at Chernobyl. And people did not fail to recognize that that was a puzzling phenomenon, given the word Chernobyl means wormwood. And therefore, they were wondering whether there was some kind of hidden warning there. As I mentioned earlier, the phenomenon also of the last great event of Fatima the odour of the sun frightened people initially, and this heat and light coming too close to them made people think, is this the end of the world? So in that wider context, we don't know what's ahead, so a retreat is always a good thing to do, to have our insurance policy fully paid up. What is true is that if one looks at the history of humanity, it's cyclic, cyclic. When things get out of hand with regard to the balance between good and evil without enough reparation being made, then the balance seems to be established by a calamity. So, take it for what it's worth, that seems to be the pattern of history. It repeats itself. So, I'd like to look at two things briefly this afternoon. One, just to make an allusion to the fact that we are celebrating the feast of the other two major basilicas, because the other two, St. John Latrim and St. Mary Majors, have their feast. But this one too is a feast now, so all the four major ones are there. And we have the link with modern times in what happened at Trefontaine. I alluded in the homily to these three fountains there which gushed forth where the head of the Apostle fell and bounced three times. But what is interesting is that this is the spot that Our Lady chose in 1947 to appear. And you probably will have heard of the story, it's the question of this person who's going to murder the Pope, Bruno, Bruno Cornacciola. And he had purchased a dagger in Spain and had inscribed on it, Morte al Papa. He was going to assassinate this man who was the greatest enemy of Christianity in his perverted, extreme sectarian mentality. He had been brought up a Catholic but had got involved with a sect. It was an Adventist sect of some kind, but he'd taken it to extremes and he was going to murder the Pope. And he was about to deliver in Rome, in 1947, <coughs> a lecture which was anti-Catholic and specifically anti-Marian. He was preparing it where? Well, just in this zone of Trefontaine, because he had children, two boys and a girl, and he was letting them play a ball during the siesta while waiting for the shop of the Trappist monks to open after the siesta to purchase some chocolate for them. And this when this is when they got lost, 
initially and they would, went to look for one of the boys and he found first one and the other in ecstasy. He couldn't move them and they were just crying out, Bella Donna, Bella Donna. Eventually he saw her. And in his case, the interesting thing was that he was given a double grace. He was given a direct encounter with the Queen of Heaven, who was therefore stopping this association of the Pope. And she was also giving him very quickly the full knowledge of the true faith. And a third part of that same double grace was the fact that he had, until death, a miraculous capacity to remember every word, as though it were a tape recording, which was quite long, which was a long teaching, in his mind, and that he was able to repeat word for word every time. He has since died, not long ago. Now, I just refer to it because we'll have heard of the story already, but I want to mention one or two important things. One is that it's one of those rare occasions when heaven directly has said quite clearly that the Roman Catholic Church is the one true church, and that is important. It's formal and explicit there. And there are allusions quite clearly to the fact that the Holy Father is the Vicar of Christ on earth, and therefore that this is where the truth is to be sought. The date also of the apparition is significant. It was the day which would be eventually the Feast of Divine Mercy, I believe. And we have, it was the 12th of April. And that year, I think it was going to be the Feast of Divine Mercy had that been instituted, because it was much later that I came in. And the day on which Pope Pius XII blessed the statue of the apparition that was going to be carried solemnly in procession from St. Peter's Square, Square to Citra Fontana, where it is now, was the 5th of October 1947, which is also the date that we came across the other day uh, in connection with now blessed Bartolo Lorenzo, another protege of the Blessed Virgin in the context of the Rosary. Now, we know also that Pius XII knew that there was something strange going to happen. We have the fact that he had heard a year before there was going to be an attempt on his life that was going to be protected. He knew it from a mystic. So he wasn't surprised. And therefore, when it came to uh, an audience with the Pope, there was a group that went to pray the Holy Rosary with the Pope in his private chapel. And afterwards, it was either the private, the private Rosary or the, the private Mass of the Holy Father. It matters, it matters little. But what came out was this. There was an informal invitation to anyone who wanted to, maybe to have a word with the Holy Father before they left, just to do so. And this person, yes, I'd like to, and went up to him with the dagger and presented to him with Marte al Papa written on it and explained that was the dagger that was going to kill you, Most Holy Father. But the Blessed Virgin, the Madonna, intervened and told him the story. And he wasn't entirely surprised because he'd been prepared. So, of course, that explains why it was taken very seriously straight away by the vicariate and by the Pope himself, and it is now a sanctuary in Rome. And therefore, I will leave that bit there. It's by now history, which is fairly well known. The occasion actually when they had this talk was the 9th of December. 1949, when Bruno was part of a group invited to pray the rosary, yes, with Pius XII in his private chapel as part of the beginning of the 1950 Holy Year celebrations. 
Now, there is also a Nelal Qadha, which is significant. Our lady gave him a specifically dense teaching during the separation on her assumption, which at that stage had not yet been defined. And we therefore intuit that that would have been also something that drove Christ the Twelfth, as well as other things, to go ahead with what was given to him by the Holy Spirit to define it. It happened in that whole year, the Feast of All Saints, 1950. So these are things which matter, and they can give us a certain serenity with regard to dialogue. Words can have effects on people. We need to be aware of the power of words and therefore how to make people access them without getting involved with argument. That's the last and least fruitful way of getting the truth across. When a school child, I was about 15 at the time, and I was aware already truth had to be not in the Baptist church I was involved in. I'd stopped going to Holy Communion because I could perceive that it was not what the Lord had actually meant. And then, but there was also a certain set uncertainty that one could go either way in that situation. I had friends who were high Anglicans and they claimed to have it as well. And then there was the experience I had with the Eastern Orthodox Church in Cardiff and they certainly had it, the real presence. Mm -hmm. And so there was that element there in the back of my mind, well which should we make it the girl? In our family, on our mother's side, there were quite a few Anglican vocations. There were three brothers priests at one stage, after that man. Anyway, um, and she was saying this week, they were not <laughs> changed, we were the Anglican church. Anyway, um, so anyway, one day I wandered into an open church. Notice these open churches, the only churches that were usually open in, in well, some of the Anglican churches were open. Now they've tended to close the Anglican churches, but some of them were still open. But nowadays, usually it's only the Catholic churches that are open, and that's important. Things happen when one is an open church. So anyway, I was wandering into this open church, which really opposite our school, actually. And so I happened, as I came out of this church, to go into, there was a rack of booklets by the Catholic Truth Society, and they're in most Catholic churches in Britain. So, you know, look at this. This is a school, the schoolboy saint. Now, he's the youngest canonized saint as far as I know, uh, he was 15 and it was St. Dominic Savio. He was a protégé of St. John Bosco and because I was the same age, that spoke to my heart and it was quite strange what happened there because the Lord seemed obviously to know what was in my heart, which way should things go at this point, and I opened it and what I found was the vision that he had. It was a field all full of mist. In it, he could see the Supreme Pontiff coming with a bright light, dispersing this mist. And he was given to understand that this was England, and that the true light of the faith was coming back. Now, historically, that vision corresponds with just before the setting up, the re-establishment of the hierarchy in England and Wales. And so it was an important moment in history, and of course that was all speaking to me. So anyway, I thought, well, that's kind of accidental, is it or not? And I thought, well, I'm going to read these signs, because sometimes the Lord uses all kinds of hints, secondary causes, but they're actually being moved by the prime mover, the primary cause, cause which is God. And so this is his language, and if we can cop onto that language, we can manipulate it. Because I've had experiences in recent times of the effects of not words that one is at the moment pronouncing, but words that have gone out. Two forms, written, and the other transmitted. Now, with regard to the written things, because I do write books and things as well, things come out of the blue years later. Wow, something kind of not letters coming from New Zealand, that kind of thing. And then the other one, these things going down to YouTube. Now, there, it's as though when one is in church, one is preaching to those before you, but one forgets that church is full of invisible souls through that tube. And that's where things start to happen without you realizing it, because you're multiplying things there and they pass them around amongst themselves. And so 
the kind of things that come back out of nowhere are this kind of thing, that that particular teaching, whatever it might have been, had an impact on my life and changed things. We don't see that, that there's no glory for the individual because there's no patting on the back. But the Lord is using these. And also, it's important to be aware that we can do the same. If we can manipulate these modern means, which are the new pulpits of our time, we need to get in there and know how to do it. It's far more efficacious, rather than dialogue in a debate which is dysfunctional with somebody who's got a position that he wants to keep on to at all costs, to know calmly what's out there, and look, would you like to go into this YouTube, it might be of interest to you, and what happens there is quite different. The dynamics are not the same. A person alone isn't going to act in the same way as when he's with you. He is actually there before fact, before well-presented fact. So calmly he looks and thinks, looks and thinks, and in that case he dialogues with himself. The tube isn't going to answer him, but he thinks about it calmly. He might grunt and dismiss it, but he might not. It will perhaps play on his imagination, and he might come back to you, and you might put him to another one. Now, the kind of things that are useful around nowadays are tests with regard to extremely powerful and even very recent miracles which indicate the truth of real presence and also linked with the Holy Shroud, proving the same blood and that kind of thing. The very recent research done on the Holy Shroud itself, things specifically with the Catholic faith which indicate that heaven is always talking a Catholic language in apparitions and miracles, which you don't find in the Protestant field. They have miracles, but they're always neutral. When prayer is very sincere, intense, they claim the Lord's promise. When two or three are gathered, the Lord takes that seriously and he heals. Not always, but it can happen. Why? It's neutral, it's not having any dogma. But you find in the Catholic setup something a bit different. This element of directly dogmatic material coming through which heaven is actually underlining to a specific dogmatic miracle. So this is calm fact. You just know how to find it and leave them to it. It's very important with young people because that's where they're spending their time. They don't read much nowadays. They look at these things a lot. And there are people out there who are doing very good work on this cybersphere for the Lord. They know its importance. The unfortunate thing is that a lot of it proportionally comes from the other side of the Atlantic. And that's partly why people who land on what comes out of my things are peacefully finding something, oh, this is not the American stuff, this is kind of Anglo Saxon, it's a bit calmer, and they actually like it. There's so much of the other stuff around. And often, often, unfortunately, it's dominated by the born again Christians. So they kind of like it when something is not like that for once. Um, because the English language is extremely important in the cybersphere. It's, it's massively out there, and therefore it hits people from all over the place. Echoes come from all over the place. Australia, South Africa, even third world countries. It's massively followed, the YouTubes in English. So it's a hugely powerful way of getting through to people. But also, it's out there, richly there, knowing how to find things in that massive well, which are worth fishing out and offering to individual souls. So I leave that with you, because we're in modern times, and when the 16th wants us to get in there, and not leave it to others. But it's important, because when handling young people, they will, with difficulty now, just sit back and be catechized. They need something living. And these are means of getting through to them in a way that will actually engage. Now, also in the whole plethora of things out there that are usable are the fairly large number, actually, of experiences of people who have died, either through suicide or through an accident or through whatever it might be, an overdose, and have had, therefore, this experience of going through the tunnel and onto the other side and all the rest of it, but then through a divine misericord that they've been allowed to come back and have a second chance, but on condition that they say things and what's out there to those who are left behind. So there's quite a lot out there, and it, it, it's a great help. Now, I've got just one here, I'll uh, just allude to it briefly. 
Oh, by the way, there are all kinds of things out there that you're supposed to be aware of, and these are things which people have picked up while in animation using a cell phone. These are silhouettes of Blessed Lady in animation from the monsters in different places there. That's kind of thing is out there. Um, here we have this person, and the, it's interesting because it's modern. It's kind of the language that people understand, young people. So uh, I'll just refer to it briefly because it's something to be aware of as an example of the kind of thing that will actually get at the will by the imagination. It's a story, it's a true story, it's a recent story. It's their life. So, what happens in this case? It's a certain Mr. Rathbun. His first name is Randall, with a double L. So he was a research mathematician in Oregon. He had a severe crash in his motor car in 2002, August the 30th. I could, I could sense that my descent was quickening faster and faster. It was like free-falling down an empty elevator shaft. And he wasn't ready to go. I was being taken to hell. It was so terrifying that the human mind can't comprehend the experience. I was bound in three chains and a very powerful spirit was holding me. It was this thing that was five feet tall maybe three or four hundred times as strong as man. An extremely loud scream burst right beside my head. The scream came from the demon and was so loud it almost deafened him. It was a voice that was screaming like a jet engine, an angry, defiant voice. And I recognised what it was now saying. He's mine! He's mine! His name is Liar! 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 I am taking him to the lake of fire. So he was working, this gentleman, on the F-22 stealth fighter for TRW in California at the time. Formerly he'd been a brilliant student, very bright in his class, and Maria Cum Laude in engineering at Montana State University. He says that the head of this creature was mishappen, not human, like a skull, but not a skull, with skin that was dark leather and almost black, and looked like someone who'd been dead for a thousand years, pure hate. That, by the way, is something that sometimes hits souls who go from one atmosphere to another to find Christian goodness and charity compared with the culture that is massively out there in for instance, hard line Islamic countries where it's based on, even from childhood onwards, vengeance and hatred, vengeance and hatred. If you see how they're bringing up their children, it's quite frightening compared with what happens in the natural atmosphere of bringing up children in grace and warmth and forgiveness and charity. Say what you like, there's a huge difference between Christian culture and anything else. So, this is the presence that he has with him. Eyes that were deep set with two fiery points of light, that were like ice picks. When I looked at them, and they pierced mine. They had a desire to kill me. So, a bit of the history of this person having gone into that state. History of problems, starting with molestation when he was quite young, at the hands of an older, abusive student. So it seems that that opened already the door to evil. So, eventually graduating in high school, a pattern, these habits which we mentioned earlier, a pattern of viewing what he calls soft core pornography. But then that led to other things, eventually visiting prostitutes on weekend nights, even as he attended church services on Sunday, because he had an experience of being born again in the 1970s, the early 1970s. But you see these people, because they can fall back. But the only thing is, and he goes into this, it's a dangerous attitude, this question of those Christians of that evangelical wing who get saved, get born again, and think then afterwards they're okay. It's a dangerous attitude. 
And he warns people in this about that, because that was his situation. So, emotional issues, at one point a near nervous breakdown. And this bit, with regard to the coaxing voice, which if one listens to young people who have been close to suicide or actually tried it, it comes out, this enticement to suicide. I was talking to one man in the Hermitage one day, he'd been in prison and he was put in a worse prison, a uh, high security one, and he was warned when he got there, don't commit suicide, by a person from the IRA uh, who had some Catholic faith. And anyway, he kept this, because there all kind of suicides going on there to, to shorten the thing. And he found this presence coming to him and copped on. Are you the presence? Are you the one who got all these others to commit suicide? And then from that point, it stopped being an intent and a wonderful, warm feeling to go towards taking the rope out and all that into an aggressive one. Yes! So he realized, and uh, he said to the president, Oh, give me an hour, and I think about it. So the president went away, and for the first time ever, he got on his knees and prayed sincerely, and was given a huge grace. And he's now going around arguing his testimony. This presence was real. It was a warm feeling initially, and I've heard it from young people, something is pulling them, drawing them to suicide, and sometimes it's a voice. <coughs> so, this comes out in his case. A voice that told him to take his hand off the wheel of his car just before he crashed into a concrete pillar, and he did so. He was in a downward spiral even before the crash. He says his wayward lifestyle began by what he viewed on the internet. And he gives evidence that it is more common than people think among the official Christians. He cites the polling company, a major one in the States, the Barna Group, showing that more than half of Christian men view pornography. Now, this of course is habitudinarian. It's one of these habits that becomes addictive. And habit is something that greatly favours the demon. He comes into this now. He, at this point, was going down, down, down. He realizes he's in big trouble on the other side now. And he starts to have this reaction, remembering that he had given his life at one stage to the Lord in the early 1970s. And he starts to half pray, half say, Why, why is this happening to me? But something happened. The Lord then started to reverse the direction, and he was being drawn in the other opposite direction, not going down anymore, but upwards. He was given, at that point, the language that he would have, as an evangelical, understand. Three scriptures. One was Romans 6.23, and it spoke to him, he could hear the voice of that verse from scripture, it's about the wages of sin, not death. The other one was John 8.34, and the other Galatians 6.7. And he could see at this point a long, long trail of sexual sins. Worse yet, this is the point, I could see how I had deceived myself. I had truly deceived myself into believing that I could willfully sin, yet God's grace would cover me. And I've seen this on YouTube, that evangelicals themselves are warning about this heresy of theirs within their thing. It's dangerous. Falling back on just the experience they've had once. So, in other words, he felt he could sin, but everything would be okay. He simply asked God to forgive him afterward. A little sin won't hurt. God will understand. Mm. So, he relates that as he fell down that shaft, the atmosphere had become crushing beyond reckoning. It began to get very warm and oppressive. 
I began to have trouble breathing. It was as if thick smoke was starting to smother everything. Now this is frightening. He heard a roar and screams. It was the worst screams you can imagine. Thousands of people screaming. No, millions of people screaming. The screams were so awful that you couldn't bear them. Just one scream alone would make the hair on the back of your arm stand up. But I was hearing millions of them. There were screams of torment, screams of pain, screams of suffering, screams of obscenities, screams of rebellion. But most of all, screams of hell by the damned. That's a young intellectual man in America saying this, not a woman of 18. And then the roar of flames, it was constant. It sounded like a continuing rolling thunder, or flames consuming but yet not consuming. I had heard fire while living on the earth, and had seen the hundred foot flames incinerate hillsides in a few seconds. Remember his work. But the flames on earth were nothing compared to the sound I was beginning to hear. Beginning to hear. Now he goes into this. More than a single sin. It's a pattern that causes trouble with God. He emphasizes a pattern. So, God, tremendous in mercy, that's why it's good to read this on the last but two days of the hour of mercy, at the hour of mercy on Friday, in a place where mercy is fully lived. God so tremendous in mercy had pity on Rathburn, and after a moment in which everything went dark, he suddenly found himself far above the pit, what he describes as 3,000 miles above the earth. God spoke to him and said it was the suffering of Jesus, the precious blood that had saved him. That had given him that second chance. In his rendition, the Lord told him he had a major decision to make and that he would be given the time he needed, returned to earth, that is, to make it. And this word is consoling. I trust you, my son, the Lord intoned, with a voice that Bramble claims had so much authority, total, absolute authority, the whole place just shook with that authority. You heard, hear that voice and you know he is the most powerful force in the universe. Just by chance, it put exactly the same picture I have in my kitchen in the hermitage there. The wounded face of Christ was given to me by a little travelling lassie. I have simple faith in travelling people. So, hearing that God trusted him, woke something inside of me. I don't want to hurt him, says Rathbone emotionally. This gets back to the idea of patterns. What wrong patterns are in our lives? Do we examine our consciences in prayer? The key to shaking his sinful habit, says this engineer, is simply drawing closer to God, falling in love with him. We're constantly watched by the good side and the bad side, he says, and the dark spirit will take advantage of any opening. Hence the danger of these chakras in New Age. They open the soul, and I've heard that that is a real problem with regard to exorcism. There are genuine invitations to the other side. So, the dark spirit will take advantage of any opening. Rathman believes that he was allowed to return in part to let others know what he witnessed. And he goes on, we're becoming lawless. He's talking about the current society in general. Disconnected more and more from God. He knows our hearts and is very interested in the purity of them. So, this gentleman, there he is, you can see him drink a cup of tea, nice little man. He is currently working as a designing man in designing programs for a financial investor. But he was also, before he came back and is now able to testify to all this, shown the other side, which is concerning the point of which I want to finish. This the conference, he was shown what awaits the victorious soul. 
That was as good as hell was bad, actually infinitely more so, pleasant beyond imagining. It is totally awesome. It's just going to blow you away. You'll see what an incredibly, incredibly gracious, loving father he is. In everything, uh, in heaven, everything is alive. The grass there vastly exceeds grass on earth. And there was this praise and worship music you could always tune into. Now, do you know that that's been captured on tape? Uh, you've come across maybe the case of Padre Matteo Lagua, the Sicilian exorcist who died not that long ago. He was well known in the south of Italy, but he was a very powerful man and had great gifts. He was not in the charismatic anymore, but he was very orthodox and his bosses were very powerful. And he was a very strong exorcist. And before he died, he consented to make a long interview, and it's in book four, which is a good one. And I got it in my sermon. It's, it's, it's worth reading because it just shows what fighting hand to hand combat with a demon is. But at one point, not long before he died, this happened. And this is something I should point out to him again. It's on YouTube. He was celebrating a large mass in Sicily, and it was charismatic in style, very faithful to the church, no gimmicks, and the reverence could be felt there, and it was a deep mode of prayer, and something happened, and he knew that morning that something was going to happen. He'd been given that to understand in prayer something would happen today at Mars. Ignore what? And it happened. And if you hear this on tape, because people have to be taking the celebration, and he got to the words of consecration, and you can hear them, you can hear the words of consecration, they're in Italian, and it starts to happen first gently and then more and more strongly, and the music ministry stops. They hear it, they have to stop. We have a testimony of one who's playing gently music there. Tutti hanno bocca aperta, bocca aperta! And so they all stop any music, and this is left to itself. As he's consecrating, you can hear this angelic chorus of praise and worship surrounding the consecration. And because they put it on tape, after the celebration, they take it to the nearby University of Palermo and confide it to the scientific staff there for analysis. They calmly go through all the analysis necessary and calmly in the document of analysis conclude the sounds produced in this tape are not producible by human voices or instruments. It is not of anything that we know. That's just <coughs> analysis. And it's out there on YouTube and uh, it would have an Italian title. Oh, actually, no, they would have probably put an English title on it as well. You get it through going to the English. And uh, although you'll hear the interview going on in Italian, uh, with people who are present, uh, what actually comes out, it doesn't matter because the sound is there very well, and you'll find it even with the English. Um, something like this would find it, because one thing pulls up the other on YouTube. Um, angel singing, or angelic singing, caught on tape or something. If you fiddle around in that realm, it'll come up anyway. One thing leads to another. And it's happening in Sicily. Angel voices, caught on tape, that kind of thing. So, anyway, that little parenthesis to say that that's what he's referring to. And that's why it is proper that we be aware of that when it comes to allowing and favouring a certain type of music ministry. It's enough sometimes for peace, to, for the sake of peace to say yes, 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 but then anything goes. If they have a certain aesthetic awareness, they have the right, even on the human level, not to talk about the responsibility for God, to actually in some way orientate and encourage them to get the best of what's out there. There are good things out there. Actually, they're blessed to have things which are easily pick up a book and elevate it. That when Tese chants are used well in harmony, they do elevate, and they're not difficult. Now, so things are as though alive. Everything in heaven is giving praise to God. I found myself among wonderful blossoms and fruit, 
An apricot aroma. Look at the smells. Hence it is that we have the right also to that in our praise. All the senses are involved. Don't be afraid of incense. Totally delightful and pure. When I grew up, we had a special apricot tree that we really enjoyed. I bore so much fruit, it bore so much fruit, the branches nearly broke with apricots. I loved that, and God knew it, and puts you in a place in heaven where you fit in. Now that was a special extra reward. The apricots are viewed as a man. Now get here safe and sound. They're saying the same thing to us. Get here safe and sound. 